back with another freaking video man bring you another one of these trillion ones you already know what it is man you already know my spiel you already know what i say solo dolo right now man you already know what it is man but so i got up some trevor man 60 minute interview um i'm hopefully i can post this video since it's 60 minutes but i'm gonna try to get it up y'all know if, if y'all don't see it then you know it didn't make it up but y'all see this man i got this up and it was going and i posted it so it's a six minute interview i'm so i'm assuming talking about his life situation where he is now so let's get it no lie anytime i used to see that 60 minute clock come up from this show it used to be so boring anytime i saw 60 minute come up i'm like man okay I probably need I, I need to be outside or doing some homework or figure out what I'm doing with my life. But <laughs> look across the landscape of late night television and you'll see that most of the hosts are white men in their 40s and 50s. Right. But not Trevor Noah. He's biracial. He's not American. And he's only 38. But he's a certified celebrity with a global following who has brought an international dimension to Comedy Central's The Daily Show. Okay. He's from South Africa, where he grew up under apartheid. He called his memoir Born a Crime because it was illegal for a black woman like his mother and a white man like his father to mix. As we first reported in December, Trevor says he's always felt like an outs- Speed it up now. Speed it up. Fighter. But his humor, making people laugh, has been his ticket to belonging. The story will continue in a moment. Trevor Noah is back on tour with his comedy show in a different city practically every weekend. Wow. Yeah, like when you're in Texas, they'd be like, you got any weapons in the vehicle? And you're like, no, sir. They're like, all right, here's one. Here you go. <laughs> you all have a good night now. <laughs> he loves owning the stage, the roar of the big crowd, typically 15,000 in giant arenas Ooh. like this one in Washington, D.C. Super paid, bro. You sell out them arenas? Ah, them checks be big. All right, guys, here we go. We're about to start taping our model. Well, it's a far cry from his more confined TV studio day job on The Daily Show, where he had a shaky start when he took over six years ago from Jon Stewart. And now it feels like the family has a new stepdad. <laughs> and he's black. Was it a good decision? Terrible initially. <laughs> <laughs> Awful. Don't take the Daily Show, Leslie. When they I didn't know there was issues in the beginning. What were the issues in the beginning? Like, was it not funny? People weren't, weren't into it? Or like, what was going on in the very beginning? Because I don't remember the start. I just remember like when he was, you know, a couple of years in, I zoomed in and saw that, but. They offered to, whatever you do, don't, don't take the daily show. <laughs> well, what happened in the beginning? Oh, I mean, everybody hated me. People didn't even know me and they hated the idea of me. But you did have a savior, Donald Trump. Once you realize that Trump is basically the perfect African president, <laughs> you start to notice the similarities everywhere. Once he found his foil, the secret document, his I... ratings began to improve, and he realized he could connect American politics to his background in South Africa. <laughs> he grew up in Johannesburg and its black township of Soweto, Soweto during the strict racial separation regime of apartheid. He always felt like an outsider, not quite black like his Kosa mother, not quite white like his Swiss father, who he has seen infrequently in his life. To be with your father who was white, that was a crime. Yeah. This was the law that forbade anybody of different races from mixing. There's something I heard, I'm not sure I believe it, but your grandfather used to call you master? Yeah. Because well, of the color of your skin? That's how he <laughs> referred to me. <laughs> I mean, that in, I'm sorry, that's still gonna be funny, bro. Master. And he'd always force me to sit in the back of the car. Be like, master, what can the police say if I say the master is sitting with me? Your parents, your grandmother particularly, was always <laughs> afraid the police were going to come yes. and find you. Wow. What would have happened if they found you? I probably would have been taken away to an orphanage. No. Yeah. 
Your grandmother was always hiding you. Yes. You were in lockdown. Right. I was in, I was in pandemic before pandemic even existed. But you were poor. You write in your book about um, eating worms and having a toy that was a brick. Bruh, why did, when she said that, he gulped and everything, he was like, oh boy, it's gonna be an uncomfortable little space. Here's the thing that I always say to people, being poor in a group or in a community that is poor is not as bad as being poor when you know what you're missing out on. Okay. So when I grew up, we played with bricks as cars and you'd smash them into each other. And it was one of the most fun games I've ever played. The same thing with eating Mopani worms. What I didn't like was when we couldn't eat anything else. And my mom said, we're going to have to eat these Mopani worms for longer because we don't have money to buy chicken. Spending that time sucks. indoors, he became a voracious reader. Oh, he man. wrote about his mother, Patricia Noah, uh, oh, in his mama? memoir, Born a Crime. Oh, that's his mom. I was one, I haven't seen her. Okay, yeah, pretty lady. Saying she raised him almost as if he was white, with no limitations on what he could achieve. He wrote it was just the two of them, him and his mom, against the world. But then she married a man named Abel, who he said beat up his mother, then shot her in the head. The head bullets didn't hit anything vital, yeah? other than the head, obviously. <laughs> but it missed her spinal cord, missed the nerves, didn't touch the brain, and all it did was it cut a piece of her nostril off, just, just one side, and the bullet went out clean. And my mom looks at me and she goes, shh, shh, Trevor, Trevor, shh, shh, don't cry, baby. I said, no, mom, I'm gonna cry, you were shot in the head. And she says, no, 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 look on the bright side. I said, what brain side? She says, no, at least now because of my nose, you're officially the best looking person in the family. You did say you had the black world and you had the white world. And this is a quote from you. All I wanted to do was belong. Everybody wants to belong. Half of our fights in life are because we want to belong. And so I grew up in a country where I was told that your belonging was defined by the shade of the color of your skin. And that never worked for me. In this country you know, too. I found my greatest joy w was with the people where we shared interests and, and the way we spoke and the way we laughed, etc. So I always wanted to belong. And, and that, that, I think, has been a, a gift and a curse in life. I have a funny feeling that you did belong because you were funny. Funny is something that I developed as a tool, yeah, to belong. He was funny back in Johannesburg, but became a professional comedian by accident when he was 22 and took the stage at a comedy club on a dare from his cousin. Oh. Yeah, you laugh, but it's true, because I'm, like, mixed, you know? I've got, like, a percentage share, like, it's that type of thing. It's he like killed deal. it, gave up his plan to go to college, and soon... I would have, too. I would take that risk. All right. Nah, forget this. Forget this. Because you already know, man, when you're in your calling space, man, it's just something about an aura feeling that you get. Like something that you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Moon was touring all over the world as a stand up comic. According to Forbes, he's one of the highest paid comedians today. Really? He first started touring the United States in 2011, and a year later, from the time I was a young child, I've always wanted one thing, and that is, I've always wanted to be black. Um, he was on The Tonight Show dream, and caught the attention of John Stewart's producer at The Daily Show, a Viacom CBS property. When he was eventually offered the host chair, he said it would have meant taking a pay cut and giving up his life on the road. So Stewart had to talk him into it. 